Welcome to online session four. Today we're going to be talking about reading comprehension assessment and instruction. So if you want to take out your online session outline as well as your rights on cooter text and um, be sure to have the internet handy throughout. We're going to do the same thing that we've done in sessions um, one and three. So first before we start talking about um, reading comprehension assessment and instruction directly, let's revisit what good readers do and um, or perhaps skilled or proficient readers do. And we know that um, good readers know what to do when they don't understand words and text. They have uh, strategic knowledge and they use that knowledge before, during, and after reading. So it's a cyclical process and it's a strategic process. They think as they read, so in other words they're able to extract meaning while they're reading as well as construct meaning through making connections whether that's connections to um, other things they've read whether it's connections to them themselves as readers or connections beyond um, themselves in the text and to connections to the greater world um, skilled readers also are able to critically analyze texts and um, are able to not only infer but able to think about who's writing this text, why they're writing this text, and what are the deeper messages and meanings beyond um, the words on the page. So we look to a fairly accepted definition of reading comprehension. This is from um, Catherine Snow's work on the RAND uh, review of reading comprehension studies. It's also cited in um, the What's Works Clearing, what Works Clearinghouse um, review of reading comprehension research, which we'll look at here in just a second. But the definition is as follows. This process of simultaneously extracting and constructing meaning through interaction and involvement with written language. So it's this notion of being able to take out meaning as well as construct meaning. So it's a very interactive process um, and involves interaction and involvement. So that basically means taking meaning, bringing meaning, and thinking within and beyond text. So reading comprehension is this very complex interactive process that when we look at assessment, it's sometimes difficult to tease out. If you remember reading at the beginning of chapter, um, I believe it was chapter 9 in Wright's Lynn Cooter, about um, Kinch and his um, interactive um, theory of reading and the notion of constructing um, knowledge using background knowledge, what knowledge the reader brings to the text, and etc. It's very complex. If you ever want to go beyond what is offered in this course as far as looking at schema theory and construction integration theory, there are texts that can help you do that. Um, Rudell and Rudell have the theoretical processes and models of reading, which is a dense read, but a um, fascinating, fascinating read. And um, it's probably about 10 pounds, so you may want to may want to put that one in your backpack. So um, moving on, let's sort of think about what is the evidence of comprehension. Um, we know what good readers do, and through that observation, as well as um, how that is revealed, it's revealed through talking and writing clearly, and it's it's um, revealed through strategic understanding, and that's before, obviously, during and after reading, which is a little bit more difficult to tease out, um, but there are ways in which we can determine um, how students are using strategies during, before, during, and after reading. And obviously students who are able to make connections, and it's active connections, ongoing connections, um, that's clearly evidence of comprehension. So that brings us to, we've defined it, we've thought about how we observe that. So it brings us to how do we assess comprehension. And um, your text talks about several components in which are crucial to look at comprehension because it is such a complex process that um, we have to consider various aspects of 
or influences factors on comprehension. We also have to think about, obviously, the development of the child and um, where they are in the reading process, as well as where they are um, cognitively, how they're developing. So we look um, at, obviously, language comprehension. Now, language comprehension, if you remember from the CLA framework, let's just revisit that really quick. If you want to take out your CLA framework from um, the first session, if you remember the CLA framework is a cognitive framework for learning to read. So um, we're looking solely at learning to read. So when we think about children who are K through 2, kind of in Charles uh, stages 0, 1, and maybe even a little bit of stage 2, we know that language comprehension is our best um, measure of understanding whether or not the child does indeed understand or comprehend. And um, in order to, so language comprehend precedes this notion of being able to take, um, being able to understand language and understand how language works both semantically and syntactically and how to draw out explicit and implicit um, understandings and messages contained in language and that that's important to reading comprehension. It's important to understand um, the language aspect and for children who are glued to the print so to speak or who are learning print such as kinder, first grade, um, perhaps early second grade, um, language comprehension is our best measure of comprehension. So we look at um, this is when we read stories to children and we ask for oral retellings. That is measuring language comprehension. Reading or text comprehension on the flip side is um, after a child has silently read or orally read a piece of text and then asking them to retell and or probing them with questions about what they read that's reading or text comprehension. That's obviously much more important as children become um, less glued to the print. So when you think about the crucial years like um, kinder first and second with regard to um, looking at comprehension, you want to you want to measure both language comprehension and then as they become less glued to the print reading or text comprehension. So another aspect of comprehension that we want to assess and measure is, or at least investigate, is prior knowledge. And um, in your text on page 280, Reitzel and Cooter give sort of a, um, the Langer's background knowledge assessment procedure. I found this really interesting, um, this notion of pulling out vocabulary terms, because we often associate uh, vocabulary and oral language with prior knowledge, pulling out these five to ten specific vocabulary terms and probing their knowledge of these terms and what these terms mean. And I thought what a great um, what a great assessment tool f before teaching a perhaps a more complex text or a text that you know has those tier two words in it that you want students to know and to understand because they're going to be able to use them in multiple contexts. So um, I saw that as a very interesting assessment tool and I'm not sure that prior knowledge, um, prior knowledge is always more formally tested. I think it's much more informally assessed and activated through strategies such as the KWL or through questioning or brainstorming. Um, so I thought that, that that assessment procedure from Langer was something interesting and, and sort of unique. We also look at um, other factors that perhaps are sometimes hidden um, and that would be motivation, self-perception, and metacognitive awareness, but those are most certainly factors on comprehension, and there are researchers who have spent a good deal of their time and their work um, investigating how those do um, affect, as well as how significantly they are correlated to reading comprehension ability. So motivation and self-perception, as you all have um, 
already sort of looked at with regard to the self-perception scale and attitudes towards reading. So you kind of have an understanding there why that's important to assess. Metacognitive awareness, um, on the under, other hand, is um, understanding those underlying strategies that children use when reading. And I think on pages 281 through pages 286, um, Wright's own creator give you a couple of assessment tools um, to, to use that with. I have personally used the Meta Comprehension Strategy Index, and um, I found that to be um, helpful for probably older children. I think typically grades three through eight. Um, however, you probably could reword um, some of the questions to make it a little bit more appropriate for perhaps a second grader um, and maybe even a third grader with the classroom modified reading strategy use table. Um, but a reading, a running record can also give you to some extent some metacognitive awareness as far as looking at the miscues, um, but it's most certainly not as in-depth as something like the Metacomprehension Strategy Index. You can also have a child think aloud for you while they're reading, or read aloud, <laughs> simultaneously doing a think aloud, to give you an idea of what strategies they use and questioning them throughout the process. So when we assess comprehension, we look at it multidimensionally. Obviously, we look at language comprehension earlier on. That's a much more um, important indicator early on. And then as children become less and less glued to the print, we look at reading and text comprehension. And obviously prior knowledge, motivation, self-perception, and metacognitive awareness can all be assessed um, in varying ages to varying degrees. So what are some common assessments for comprehension? Well, I'm sure you know many of these formal assessments, obviously. Woodcock-Johnson, reading mastery, which um, can be used as a diagnostic tool. Some people might even use it as a screening, but typically a diagnostic tool. The Gates-McGinney and the Gray Oral Reading Test are both two assessments that historically have been used f as diagnostic measures um, and even as screening measures for comprehension. And then, of course, more informal assessments that you've read about and that you use in, um, right now. Obviously, IRIs, running records, oral retellings, uh, questioning, closed procedure, story structure, these are all within chapters 9 and 10 of your text. And they're things that obviously many of you are already using. But these are common assessments for comprehension. And remember, you can always go to that CEDL database for assessments to find out more um, varying assessments for differing grades. What I'd like for you to do right now is I'd like you to go to your online outline and to take a look at the different components that we just discussed or aspects of um, reading comprehension and to complete this uh, chart here looking at language comprehension. Why is this important to assess? Uh, what are some assessments in which we can um, assess language comprehension? Think about some of the tools that you have. You have your textbook, you have this, you have access to the CLA database um, for different assessments, as well as differing things that you already have prior knowledge of. Um, so include two, three, four assessments that you feel would be appropriate. Um, for assessing each of these components, as well as when to assess, what what ages do we assess this, or could we assess this? And then obviously instructional implications, what are some things that we could do to help support language comprehension? What are some things we could do to help support text comprehension, prior knowledge, motivation, and metacognition? Obviously, um, there are no right and wrong answers on these. Um, however, there are more informed answers, so there may be some answers in your text as well as in other places, your prior knowledge as well as um, other readings that you've done for this course, Candy's course, Dr. Yoon's course, etc. So if you'll take time right now to do that,
next thing I'd like you to do is to um, access this article by Louise Spear Swirling. She is sort of a guru in the fields of reading and special education. It's on ldonline.org. Um, if you would access this article, read through it. It gives um, an interesting spin on uh, existing tests of reading comprehension and sort of gives a quick overview of certain concerns that we have. As you know, um, there's no perfect assessment and there's certainly not a perfect assessment for reading comprehension because reading comprehension is so complex and there are various factors involved. Um, however, if you'd read through this article, um, I'm going to ask you a question about this in your postings this week. So take time to do that right now. Um, this, may, this LD Online may be a a great asset for working with students with um, reading related learning disabilities as well as other learning disabilities and ADHD. Um, but there are just a ton of different topics as, as far as like basic fact sheets, questions and answers, there's stuff for educators, parents, kids, um, expert advice. This is a great resource if you haven't already tapped into it. Okay. You've spent some time looking at assessments, possible assessments, as well as understanding some um, caveats that are associated with reading comprehension assessments. Now I sort of want to turn the, turn the table and to think about, okay, well we've assessed these varying aspects of reading comprehension and now we need to translate it into an inter intentional instruction or intervention. And so I'd like to um, in addition to what you read in chapters 9 and 10, I'd like to also turn your attention to some uh, research, re to a research review that has um, given us sort of an indication of what strong evidence there is with regard to reading comprehension instruction. So before we do that though, we have to really think about what's the whole goal of reading comprehension instruction. And that is ultimately for our students to make meaning and to make connections obviously to themselves, to the text, so inferencing, thinking about what the author is saying as well as thinking beyond what the author is saying, as well as making text to world connections. So essentially the whole goal of reading comprehension instruction is to make meaning and that should always be sort of in the front, forefront, the, the, the velcro of your, of your mind there. So with that said, there's been a great deal of attention on reading comprehension um, in the past few years and there was a huge um, methodological review of research around comprehension and that can be published, um, it's published on the What Works Clearinghouse and can be found there. I'm going to show you before I talk through the findings, I'm going to show you where to find that. It's also in folder three. But you can download the practice guide, which gives like incredible, um, it gives not only the recommendations, the level of evidence for each recommendation, but then gives you examples on these PDFs of how, what that looks like in your classroom and how to do it. And if you look over here at the authors of this publication, who reviewed this research um, on comprehension in grades K through 3. It's kind of the who's who of um, reading research with regard to, it's a very balanced panel of people, but um, well-known people. So we have people from special education here, Christopher Schatz Snyder, just uh, Joe Torgerson, as well as kind of the greats in reading. So I find this, um, I find this to be a very uh, balanced perspective on reading comprehension. So I hope that I hope that you will take time to look at it. What we are going to do right now is we're going to look at sort of their recommendations, what they found, and then we're going to take one of those recommendations and really um, unpack it. So the first recommendation was to teach students how to use strategies to deepen reading comprehension. Reading strategies is a complete buzzword in um, this field, but I think there's something to it. There's strong evidence to support that when we help readers become strategic that they um, are able to make meaning on varying levels and to varying degrees and across time. The panel also found that um, helping to teach students to identify and to use text structure 
is actually is actually moderately effective. They also found that guiding students through focused high quality discussion of the meaning of text is also important though they found it to be minimally important it is still important enough to be a recommendation and I think any of us that have guided students through focused high quality discussion on meaning and text we know it's it's a crucial aspect to comprehension comprehension instruction and uh, additionally selecting text purposely to support comprehension development and establish an engaging and motivating context in which to teach reading comprehension if you notice that last recommendation there was strong evidence to support that um, and so I would encourage you to take some time to look through this document, this What Works Clearinghouse document, and to look at um, not only the criteria for how they reviewed the research, what types of research they reviewed, as well as um, a list of citations of that research, and then take a look at the practitioner's guide where it has um, it, it breaks apart each of the recommendations and what that may look like for classroom instruction. In our time here, we're going to look at the first recommendation, teach students how to use strategies to deepen reading comprehension. So as we do that, I want you to keep this in mind. We're going to revisit this. These are three possible scenarios of children who may have a breakdown in comprehension. Obviously, this is not the, the only three possible scenarios, but these are three um, of children that I've worked with most recently in our partner power tutoring at one of the local elementary schools. The first one is, so I want you to keep these in mind, we're going to revisit them at the end after we go through these varying strategies and recommendations. The first one is reads fluently but misses many details of the text or has emerging retelling. So reads fluently but um, doesn't really remember many details or um, doesn't demonstrate um, proficient or even developing retelling. Uh, two, reads fluently but doesn't identify main ideas and or the purpose of the text. So this student may be able to um, may be able to recall some details and, and retell to some extent, but kind of misses the greater purpose of the text. And then third, reads fluently and makes some literal connections but not beyond. No inferencing or no text-to-world type connections. So I want you to think about those three breakdowns and possible strategies as we go through the varying um, strategies as per the recommendations from the What Works Clearinghouse Committee. The thing we're going to look at is um, so it's important to better understand or remember what is being read. Therefore a strategy is a conscious mental effort whereas a strategy is not a sole instructional activity. And they give the example of such as a worksheet, completing worksheets. Um, now it does not mean that a support material cannot be an extension of strategic learning or um, mental action, but what the authors here are saying is that um, having a student do a sequencing worksheet using this great um, graphic organizer alone without explicit instruction on how to think through sequencing that is not a strategy whereas giving explicit instruction on how to think through sequencing and obviously having some sort of support material like a worksheet or a graphic organizer is an extension so um, there's a difference between what a strategy is and what a strategy is not and those often oftentimes we we equate like the actual graphic organizer as a strategy whereas it's actually the teaching and the explicit instruction that is more that can lead to more strate strategic thinking um, so hopefully I didn't botch that too bad on you it's it can be a very difficult it can be a strange concept to unpack because um, we call so many things a strategy one way to think about strategy instruction is to situate it within a framework and the before during and during and after reading framework is one that is most is very popularly used and it's a, it's actually a really nice framework for um, thinking about intentionally teaching reading comprehension and to think about um, supporting uh, strategic readers and how that process is cyclical 
So the before, during, and after reading um, framework is really parsed out into three sections. Before reading, where as teachers we think about activating and assessing prior knowledge so that we can support students to do that on their own, obviously. We also think about building prior knowledge if indeed there is a gap there that's important for them. We know that um, obviously this is sometimes where pre-teaching vocabulary comes into play if we know that there's essential words that they need um, for comprehension purposes we build that that prior knowledge so to speak um, we also want to help establish a purpose a meaningful purpose for reading the text at hand during reading um, this is where we want to explicitly teach our students how to extract meaning how to monitor their meaning, so if there is a breakdown in comprehension, how to fix it, as well as constructing meaning. And then of course after reading, after reading or post reading is where um, we want children to be able to recall, retell, but on the same note be able to apply and respond to text, and often that's done through discussion, through writing, um, organizing, reviewing, varying different ways to extend um, the construction of knowledge after reading. But this is a nice framework for teaching comprehension and essentially we want our readers to be able to be strategic before, during, and after reading. So we're going to unpack sort of that first recommendation by the What Works Clearinghouse. Um, about teaching, explicitly teaching reading strategies. And their recommendations are centered around, um, I believe it's seven, seven different um, strategies. And the first one is activating prior knowledge. And this is um, teaching children how to um, activate their background knowledge, their schema, and to in an effort that during reading they're going to connect new information that they're reading from what they already know. So to be, be prepared to um, activate and, and parse out that what they already know prior to a topic. And this of course is often done by making predictions um, as well as um, thinking about brainstorming about what they already know. The second strategy that happens typically during and after reading is questioning. And um, it's important to understand that uh, most important questions don't always have ready answers. And so sometimes we need to give students uh, opportunities to think about questions. Because those good questions that can really measure and gauge comprehension send readers on quests. They, they, yes, we want to understand um, that they are comprehending literal information right there on the text information, but the best questions and the higher level questions send readers on quests and require time to answer them, and um, most certainly um, think time. And so we want to think about asking authentic questions and moving beyond um, initiate, respond, evaluate, or what I call ping pong questioning. And um, ping pong questioning or the IRE format of questioning, though it may be nice for um, literal responses, for those right there responses that can oftentimes when we ask right there response questions, um, questions that are found right there in the text, those can help build um, reader self-efficacy and self-esteem with regard to, hey, I can answer these questions. Perhaps I can dig a little deeper. Those are IRE questions are fine for that, but that's not where we want to stay. So we really want to think about the type of questioning that we are um, providing for our students and that we're modeling for our students so that they themselves, as they become more fluent and proficient readers, um, that as they are making meaning and comprehending that they themselves are asking questions of themselves. And also, of course, we want to model how to question the author, how to infer, and um, that's most certainly important. Some strategies that can be done to support questioning 
are uh, the QAR strategy and critical literacy practices. The QRA strategy, as you found in your text, parses questioning out into three separate ideas. The first being text explicit or text um, literal text questions as I call them. And those are questions that can be answered right there on the page. They can be found explicitly in the text. Whereas text implicit questions are questions that, that start to send readers on quests where they have to think and search. And um, it requires both the author's um, point of view and your point of view to answer those questions. And then experiential questions are those on my own questions where they students are starting to make text to world connections or even text to self connections. And so the QRA strategy is actually a very helpful strategy to help teachers um, formulate questions that are not just right there questions that actually can help you move beyond. And you can actually turn the QAR strategy into um, a student student type questioning strategy where they are asking, they are creating and asking each other those different levels of questions. And obviously um, critical literacy practices are huge in, um, to helping support students questioning. And a little bit of critical literacy practice in the classroom goes a long way. Once you teach children to, or you model for them really, how to question the author's stance and the viewpoint, and then you ask them to do the same and you continuously hold them accountable for doing the same, um, you'll find that that starts to become a point of comprehension discussions in class, is that um, once you model that for children, they um, will start to do it themselves. So you start to ask them who is and who is not represented in this text. What's the author's viewpoint? Um, what do you think they're trying to tell us? Uh, what do you think they're not trying to tell us? Um, and so I think critical literacy practices, even though we often associate these with the, the higher grades, um, in middle school and high school can most certainly be done in the context of K through 3. The third strategy that the What Works Clearinghouse panel recommended was creating sensory images and or visualization and this is obviously something that we model during reading and this is where um, we help students to picture what they're reading, to use their sensor, their senses to um, help engage them in reading. So they're, they're thinking about smelling, tasting, hearing, feeling, um, seeing, as well as thinking about um, making connections to all of those things so that um, the reading is indeed memorable and that they're able to make connections um, while they're reading. A lot of people talk about this as the movie that is playing in your head as you're reading. So you're constantly picturing what you're reading and visualizing it. And this isn't actually, this is actually a very complex process. Um, and teaching this is, takes explicit modeling and thinking aloud and, and showing children how you visualize when you read. And so obviously one strategy that supports visualization is thinking aloud and um, even probably some of the best think alouds that I've seen done um, and that I've attempted myself have been where I'm not only sharing the images with the students but I'm actually demonstrating those images as well as um, recording the things that I'm hearing and um, seeing and smelling and um, I'm, I'm, shared, I'm sharing those and at the same time I'm validating differences that this is what I see, this may not be what you see but this is what I see and I think that's very important um, because sometimes in teacher-centered instruction like I think aloud children may think well that's not what I see, that's not what I hear, that's not what I smell, that's not what I associate, so it must not be right. So it's important to validate differences in that process. So I would highly encourage you to um, 
explicitly model through thinking aloud the visualization process and to teach your children to have a video camera going on in their mind and to really explicate all those things that they're seeing, hearing, feeling when they are reading. To have you know very intentional instructional time about that. Now one way to um, help students record that information um, as you're teaching them how to explicitly visualize um, and how to pull that out on their own. One way to record that is um, different graphic organizers. Now as we said earlier the graphic organizer itself is not the strategy. Visualization is the strategy but helping them record it and have a concrete piece of evidence to associate with that activity is often a very powerful um, support material. So here you can see this getting into character map. You can find this in 50 graphic organizers. Um, this is by Karen Bromley. She's another professor here at, at, at BU. But she, um, she has an updated version of this as well. But this is one example of a support material that um, could help students record after visualizing or during visualizing to help them hold their thoughts. The next um, strategy that the What Works Clearinghouse talks about is this notion of fixing our fix-up strategies. Um, fixing while we're reading, monitoring while we're extracting and constructing meaning. And um, this is something obviously that can be done through thinking aloud. I know th the think aloud must seem like the um, uh, you know the sacred answer to everything in this class or to everything in reading instruction but it uh, thinking aloud is very powerful because um, it allows you to translate um, the practices of strategic readers and obviously teaching children to be able to um, monitor their meaning is hugely important and it's important to first to have students direct attention to the part when they're reading that doesn't make sense. And that could be a word, that could be a sentence, that could be a concept. But having them, modeling for them how to do that first will then help support the fix-up strategies that they use. So helping them to um, make sense and to direct their attention when something doesn't work. Over here I have this click and clunk strategy. <laughs> this is a strategy I've used quite a bit with um, children. I've used it in um, small group settings, in pairs, in um, tier three intervention. Um, it's a strategy that um, is multi-sensory and basically it revolves around this notion of when I'm reading and I'm getting it, it's clicking and I've got my click hold up while I'm reading my click held up while I'm reading. And when I come, a, some, come across something that doesn't quite make sense and um, I hit clunk and I use my clunk cards to help me. Those are my strategies that can help me um, fix up my clunk. And so some of those are going back and rereading, looking for key ideas, um, rereading without the clunk and seeing if it makes sense, skipping ahead, reading ahead, looking for context clues, looking for smaller words within bigger words. Um, click or clunk is a great strategy and here is an article on reading rockets that um, shares the click or clunk strategy as well as other collaborative reading strategies. So you may want to this is just sort of for your toolbox. Um, you may want to spend some time reading through this quick article by Janet Klinger and Sharon Vaughn about these different collaborative strategic reading um, processes and under here under strategy two is click or clunk and it um, shows you what to do. And then the next one is get the gist. This is a great little summary, um, great little summary instructional tool to help children fix up while they're reading. And obviously other fix-up strategies are teaching children how to look at pictures, headings, support materials, and cross-checking that information using the features of the text to help them um, fix up what they're reading. And then obviously sort of the last strategy that we want to teach children, though it's an important one, is to seek for help. Um, 
and to seek help from either the text and or others around you. But we want to teach them, obviously, y'all know this, we want to teach them lots of other strategies as well <laughs> as, as having them ask for help. So how do you teach children to know when they don't get it? Um, and this goes back to that notion of having the video camera in, in their mind. So if they have that strategy, you teach them that, well, when the movie stops or the voice in your head stops, you're having difficult time getting it and you need to think about a fix-up strategy. Or my mind wanders and um, you can easily think aloud and model that for children or um, I can't remember what I just read or I'm not able to ask and or answer questions when I'm reading and I just read about a new character but I have no idea what just happened or perhaps it's a certain word or concept that I just read about and I don't know what it means or how it fits into the bigger picture. So explicitly teaching children how to know when they don't get it so that they can direct their attention. Um, to the part that doesn't make sense, that clunks, and then provide a fix-up strategy for that. The fifth um, strategy that the What Works Clearinghouse Review Committee speaks about is drawing inferencing, and obviously thinking about the BDA framework, that's a during and after. And that's combining what is in the text with everything else one knows, and connecting any predictions. So if, if um, you're having students predict beforehand, connecting those predictions while they're reading, reaffirming any predictions that were made, and, um, and adjusting those predictions while they're reading or after they're reading. Obviously, the Common Core Standards talks a great deal about this notion of reading closely, and um, you know the Common Core folks talk a lot about rereading. Um, and reading closely so that inferencing is beginning to happen and reading between the lines. Um, however, I will argue that you can you, you can read closely, um, like people may interpret reading closely as rereading only, but that really is rereading with greater purpose and taking it up a notch each time, looking at rereading for differing purposes as opposed to just rereading. Um, also, drawing inferences is figuring out the meaning of unknown words and trying to connect what you um, know about the word, what you think the author is saying with regard to these unknown words or these unknown concepts. And then obviously inferencing is being able to pull out themes and the big message and the, the bigger lessons. So, so modeling explicitly for students how to pull out themes how to pull out main ideas, how to pull out the bigger messages, or as I say, the so what's. The next strategy is determining importance, or really what I call setting a purpose for reading. And this is typically done before reading. Teaching students to um, think about why they're reading what they're reading, what is new about what they're reading, what features of the text and the layout, what do they suggest about what I'm about to read, what are key words, can I tell what key words are, you know, in more content materials, oftentimes those are the highlighted words or the italicized words. And then um, after doing all of that, asking students to ask questions that they may have. So explicitly modeling um, before reading how to set a purpose and to determine importance before they read is actually a very powerful strategy. And if you think about it, um, as Kylene Beers says here, skilled readers consciously try to anticipate what the text is about before they begin reading. They look at the cover, the art, the title, the genre, the author, headings, graphs, charts, and other features. Um, essentially they do anything to find out something before they begin reading. Think about when you take your children to the library and they're trying to choose a book. You teach them how to look at the book and to determine whether or not they think it's going to be interesting. And the more that they do that, the more they're setting a purpose for actually picking that text up and reading it. Now dependent or striving readers, on the other hand, often don't do that. They're told to read something and once the text is in, text is in hand, they just begin. Or they're like what I call, they avoid reading, right? They're meant to go to their browsing box or they're meant to go to the library with you and they just 
kind of walk around and look like they're interested in reading, but they don't quite um, engage in the process. And sometimes these are our readers who may, you know, strive to read, but may also not have understand what it is that they um, are looking for, or have a purpose for reading or choosing a book. The last strategy is summarizing, synthesizing, and or retelling. And these are obviously during and after reading strategies. And this is where we model for our students putting it all together. And um, oftentimes we think about this as a summary, sure, but more than that. Um, yes, we want to have students identify the main storyline and or the main concepts read in the nonfiction text or expository text, but more than that, what does it all mean to me? What is the author saying? How did my thoughts change while I was reading? And um, then, as a result, being able to decide what's important and to be able to synthesize that information. And this is typically done through, obviously, either rich discussion or through writing. And um, in your text on pages 358, uh, your auth the authors of your text give a nice um, kind of walk you through a possible um, rules for writing a, um, a summary, give you kind of an idea of how to do that. Now, clearly, that's going to look different depending upon the age group of your student but could most certainly be adapted depending upon whether or not you're asking students to summarize, synthesize, and or retell in discussion or through writing. But um, those are actually very powerful um, strategies that we want to model for students and we want students to be able to do. So that sort of goes through the various um, strategies that what Works Clearinghouse highlighted through their review of comprehension research under that first recommendation about explicitly teaching students in K through 3 and obviously everybody would argue beyond that um, explicitly teaching them strategies for reading. Um, here's just a couple of sites that I thought might be interesting to you with regard to graphic organizers. Um, you know a lot of some of this teaching, explicit teaching of strategies can be complemented through gra using graphic organizers. ReadingQuest.org has lots of different um, graphic organizers, lots of different um, strategies for re well, strategies for reading comprehension or instructional practices really for comprehension, as well as um, Adlet. This is obviously adolescent literacy website, but any of these can be adapted. And what's nice about this is these are various instructional practices that can be um, be used for varying purposes. And I love how they give you a nice little chart here to tell you this works great for comprehension, this works great for vocabulary, etc. So those are two websites that um, you may be able to find some instructional resources with regard to teaching strategies for comprehension. Um, what I'd like to do now is to revisit that breakdown in comprehension. I want you to spend some time and to reread re -read through these um, scenarios and to come up with strategies uh, based on the seven that we read about as well as any others that you found in your text that you feel would be um, appropriate for intentional instruction for each of these um, three scenarios for these students. And to conclude uh, this session, just a few resources that have been particularly helpful for me, as well as I know have been helpful for literacy educators kind of all over, are obviously the What Works Clearinghouse Review of Reading Comprehension Research. Um, there's the website there that I've walked you through. And then two other books that have been really near and dear <laughs> to my heart um, with regard to teaching comprehension as well as other literacy practices. But the Marrow and Gambrell text best, literacy, best practices in literacy instruction has been around for a while. So this is the most recent fourth edition, but it's a, it's a great text. Um, gives some real good research-based insight into how to implement some of these uh, best practices for comprehension in your classroom. And um, Critical Literacy, uh, this is by Stevens and Bean, and uh, this text really walks you through what critical literacy means as a teacher and then how to implement that in your in your classroom so 
um, practical strategies to move your students beyond sort of those literal questions and even moving beyond inferencing into critically analyzing. So um, hopefully these resources will be interesting to you.